Rapid chilling of wort after the boil halts the isomerization of alpha acids, locks in volatile hop aromatics, and encourages protein coagulation for clearer beer. But this process can consume vast amounts of water, around 20 to 30 gallons for a 10 gallon batch. An alternative is the no-chill method, where the wort is left to cool to ambient temperature over many hours. But does this method affect the resulting beer? Well, to find out, we conducted three experiments with a Munich Hellers, an American IPA, and a light lager. We split each batch and applied both the rapid chilling and the no-chill method. Could tasters reliably distinguish the beers? Let's find out. This episode is sponsored by Delta Brewing Systems. More on them in a bit. One of the most important factors for ensuring a healthy fermentation involves pitching yeast into properly chilled wort. Unfortunately, the process of chilling wort with traditional immersion or counterflow chillers results in a decent amount of wasted water. Now that led some clever Aussie brewers to experiment with skipping the chilling process altogether. So instead, the hot wort gets transferred to a heat-safe plastic cube that's left alone for many hours, often overnight, to naturally chill on its own, at which point the yeast is pitched. But does this slow, no-chill approach result in a sensory different beer than one that's rapidly chilled? To find out, we're going to take a look at three experiments. And first off, we start with an experiment from Marshall Shot to evaluate the differences between two beers of the exact same recipe, where one was chilled quickly and the other utilized the no-chill method, and specifically a Munich Helles recipe using German ale yeast. Marshall brewed the beer in a single vessel, then introduced the variable at flameout. At the end of the boil, he completely filled a clean and sanitized 5-gallon HDPE cube with near boiling wort, gently stirring to ensure equal distribution of kettle trube. This process took just under two minutes. Now, HDPE, that stands for High Density Polyurethane, which is a semi-crystalline thermoplastic material that can be safely used with wort even at boiling temperatures. With the cube full, Marshall proceeded to chill the rest of the wort like normal using a King Cobra immersion chiller. In less than five minutes, the wort temperature had dropped to 82 Fahrenheit or 28 C. He racked the wort to a carboy and placed it in a cool chamber to finish cooling the rest of the way. The no-chill wort, which was left at room temperature in Marshall's house, took 15 hours to chill down to 78 Fahrenheit or 26 C. He placed the cube alongside his carboy in his cool chamber, and the following day transferred the wort to a sanitized carboy. Now, at this point, both batches were at the same temperature of 58 Fahrenheit or 14 C, and that's when they received the German ale yeast. Two days post-pitch, the no-chill batch had developed a thicker Krausen sooner than the quick-chill batch. Things eventually evened up for the quick-chill batch, and both were chugging along by day four. By six days in, fermentation appeared complete for both beers, and Marshall took hydrometer readings with both beers showing similar gravity readings. The beers were then cold-crashed, fine with gelatin, racked to kegs, then allowed to carbonate. The no-chill batch appeared ever so slightly darker with a touch more haze than the quick-chill batch, but could blind tasters actually tell them apart? Well, a total of 22 people participated in this experiment. Each participant was served two samples of the no-chill beer and one sample of the quick-chill beer, then instructed to identify the one that was different. In order to achieve statistical significance, 11 participants would have had to correctly identify the quick-chill sample as being unique. In the end, 14 tasters made the accurate selection, indicating the quick chill beer was reliably distinguishable from the no chill beer. A significant result. Now, the tasters who were correct on the triangle test, a solid majority no less, were then asked to complete a brief evaluation comparing only the different beers while still being blinded to the variable. Now, overall preference was split evenly with six tasters endorsing the quick chill beer, six preferring the no chill beer, and two saying the beers were different, but they had no particular preference. Now, in his own semi-blind tests, Marshall could also reliably distinguish the beers, saying that I experienced the difference in aroma alone as being quite noticeable, with the no chill beer processing more of a wet hay character, while the quick chill beer had a very clean and bready pills malt aroma. So in this case, no chill did make a notable 
difference. But would a difference be apparent in a much hoppier beer style? Well, before we get to that, a quick word on today's sponsor, Delta Brewing Systems. Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on stainless steel brewing gear like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 litres of wort, comes with a dome lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus it can hold up to 2 psi of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles as well as one of the lowest priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, do yourself a favor and head over to deltabrewingsystems.com today. Now, rapid chilling of wort after the boil is said to halt the isomerization of alpha acids and lock in volatile hop aromatics. With no chill, wort will spend more time over that 150 or 82C threshold, meaning a summarization may continue to be active, potentially resulting in a beer with more bitterness. So we really wanted to test this out to evaluate the differences between an IPA made using the no-chill method and one where the wort was chilled rapidly with an immersion chiller. Now, Brew Club member Matt Skillstad brewed a large batch of American IPA, then went about applying the variable. This time, instead of racking to a cube, Matt opted to use a stainless steel fermentation vessel, seeing as it can withstand such warm temperatures, and then racking half of the wort to it. He then proceeded to rapidly chill the remaining wort with an immersion chiller to pitching temps and transfer that wort into its own stainless fermenter. The rapid chill wort was placed in a fermentation chamber while the no chill wort sat in Matt's chilly garage. 19 hours later, the no chill batch had dropped to 59 Fahrenheit or 15 C, at which point Matt pitched yeast and noticed signs of fermentation in both batches after about 24 hours. At the conclusion of fermentation, both beers were racked to purge kegs, burst carbonated, and left to condition for a few weeks before being served to tasters. Now, a whopping 53 people took this triangle test, where each participant was served two samples of the no chill and one sample of the beer chilled rapidly with an immersion chiller. 24 tasters would have had to accurately identify the unique sample in order to reach statistical significance, and a total of... 26 did, indicating participants in this experiment were able to reliably distinguish the beers. The 26 participants who made the accurate selection on the triangle test were asked to select the beer they preferred, still blind to the variable. In the end, 9 tasters reported preferring the no-chill beer, while 17 tasters liked the rapid-chill beer more. The no-chill beer was noticeably more hazy and described by a number of participants as being more bitter. This may very well be due to the ongoing summarization occurring from the hops that remained in the hot wort, which could possibly be accounted for by adjusting hopping rates. It is commonly said that hot side hop additions should be made 20 minutes later than usual when using the no-chill method. Pretty interesting. So when it comes to significant findings, we're two for two. Now, inspired by these experiments, Brulosophy contributor Alex Shanks-Abel was curious how no chill would impact a much less hoppy style of beer, an American light lager. This entire five-gallon batch featured just three grams of hops, just three grams, and those were boiled for a full 90 minutes. So I think it's safe to say that any post-boil isomerization concerns should be pretty minimal. Now, Alex used sanitized corny kegs as their fermentation vessels, racking one half of the wort to a keg after the boil, then rapidly chilling the other half to 75 Fahrenheit or 24 C using a counterflow chiller before transferring that wort to a second keg. Both kegs were placed in a chamber control to 64 Fahrenheit or 18 C and left for 24 hours. A few weeks later, the beers were ready for evaluation. Unexpectedly, the no-chill beer had better foam quality and better clarity than the quick-chill batch, which I certainly wasn't expecting. Now, a total of 23 participants took our triangle test. Each participant was served two samples of the no-chill beer and one sample of the quick-chill beer. 12 tasters would have had to accurately identify the unique sample in order to reach statistical significance and... 18 did, indicating participants in this experiment were able to reliably distinguish the beers, scoring one of our lowest p-values yet. So that's three for three. Now as for the preference survey, seven tasters reported preferring the no-chill beer, 
Two said they liked the quick chill bill more, and nine had no preference or perceived no difference. In their own testing, Alex could pick out the odd beer every time, and to their palate, the no chill beer was refreshingly crisp and clean, while the quick chill version had an uncharacteristic grainy and fruity flavour. Alex enjoyed both of these beers, but definitely preferred the no chill batch. So what can we take from this? In all three experiments, the method of chilling did seem to result in a perceptible difference in the finished beer. The experiment with the Munich Hellers produced no clear winner in terms of preference. The American IPA Preference Award clearly went to the rapidly chilled beer. And when it came to the American Light Lager, the no-chill batch seemed to produce better results, both visually and in flavour. So the water-saving practices of no-chill certainly do seem to have merit, allowing a significant saving in water usage. It's something I've tried a few times myself, and anecdotally, it's worked really well for me. So how about you? Is no-chill something you've tried? And does it tend to work better for you in some styles over others? It certainly was interesting to see all three triangle tests coming back as significant here. And to get a better understanding of how this testing works and some of the surprising things that triangle tests have unearthed over the years, well, you can see all about that in this video here.